is about um, body painting and photography. And we've got a few specialists in the field here to join us. Um, Alexa should be joining us anytime her uh, computer is rebooting. So we're just going to wait for that pleasant little timer that Dave created to count down to zero. And then the official show will begin. So jump ahead if you don't want to see inane banter. Like me asking, Paul, how are you doing lately? I am very good. Very, very busy. Um, I'm just at the moment trying to reshare your post on uh, Facebook and Google+. But I've been, I've been crazy busy. In the last two months, I've traveled a lot, which is not an easy thing to do with two toddlers. <laughs> but, How old are they? Uh, three and a half and two years old. Two girls. Oh. Yeah, that's a, that's a wild age, isn't it? Yeah, so I've been running rampant for a while, <laughs> but having a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> and uh, where are we traveling to? In the last two months, I've been to New York, Philly, L.A., San Francisco, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, and back, back home, Rhode Island. Oh, and why are you traveling? Going back to, going back to L.A., in a month, I think, and possibly Korea. Wow. I've had quite a few yeah. jobs to turn down. I had to turn down Colombia, the country, and Costa Rica, <laughs> just because I don't have time to go there. And are these uh, clients that are flying you in to do body painting? Yeah, yeah, body paint Whoa. clients. That's pretty but, exciting. Uh, some of, some of the traveling is for myself, for my artwork, my own studio work, and and most of it is for clients hiring me for commissions. Wow, that's pretty exciting. Did you have you always been traveling this much for body painting work, or is it sort of new? <coughs> I've been traveling off and on since 2008. Oh, okay. It's it's becoming more often now. It's happening more often nowadays, but uh, that's cool. Which is good, but it's just difficult <laughs> with two toddlers. Like I said, if I was yeah. 22 years old, I'd be going everywhere. <laughs> I mean, I turned down like an all expenses paid plus I mean, I turned down like an all expenses paid plus commission money and all this in like a Cancun like setting in in Colombia. That was hard to do. That was like took me a week to be like, how can I pull this off? How can I pull this off? And ultimately it was just like I can't do it. I got to hand it off. Yeah, to it's a it. weird kind of stress, isn't it? Once, yeah. once you, get, you want to say yes to everything. <laughs> not, not even for the money, but just because it sounds awesome. And yeah, it's a great experience. You better regret all this fun that you're not having. Yeah, and to see the world, you know? It's just, yeah. I don't get to do that often. But I'd rather be home with my kids. I love my girls. Yeah. No, no That's more valuable to me. Hey, Hello, uh, Daniel, Alexa. Can you check, to the, our check the hangout chat enter. thing? Do it now? Check the chat. Yes, oh, shoot. keep an eye on the chat for show notes and this sort of thing. So, Alexa, we have about a minute before the show actually okay. starts, but everything is Great. on YouTube, so don't say anything embarrassing. One oh, it's on it now? Yeah, we're live right now on YouTube. Okay. I'll cool. give you the link uh, here in chat if you want to share it with your friends. Just a second here. Put up a little chat thing. You'll see it there. You can put it on cool. Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus or wherever you like. All right. And well, you can hear me all right. Since, uh, since EG. Yeah, so I saw you in um, April, and then right after that, I flew over to London for some um, projects. Um, and then I went to Paris and Switzerland to meet with galleries. And um, I'm planning my show in Switzerland in September, so I had to go check out the space. And then. Oh, um, 10 seconds. Ten, oh, okay. okay. Well, I can tell you about it later. This sounds exciting. People love to hear about these big-time Euro gallery shows. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, now or when we start? Oh, uh, you can save it to when... It will all be in a very nice manner in which we treat it. 
And so before we start looking at naked chicks, let's start saying hello to our guest here. We've got all kinds of wonderful people, um, some real uh, interesting people that are very hard to define within the artistic realm. And this is, this is actually one of my favorite kinds of art, things that are very difficult to, to categorize. And you know some of these people from Google Plus, and, and I, I met one of these people at a, at a conference called the EG Conference. And, and uh, well, let's go around and get them to introduce themselves a little bit here, and uh, we'll get to know them and their work, and they'll talk through how they do what they do and their, their inspiration and their process. And it's, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a different kind of show because uh, I just really want to focus on, on these people and kind of get into their heads and see what they're thinking. So let's start on the leftmost block here with Alexa Mead. Hi, Alexa. Hi, Jack. How are you? I'm very good. Um, I'm in my studio right now in my parents' basement in Washington, D.C. Cool. And it sounds like you've been traveling recently for, uh, you're looking at some gallery shows. Yes. Um, I unfortunately don't get to spend much time in my home studio. Um, I spent a couple of months in LA and then I saw you in April in Monterey, California. And then I went to um, London, Paris, and Zurich to meet with galleries. And I'm planning my next big show in September in Zurich. And then um, right after I got back from London, sorry, after I got back from Europe, I started um, planning my show at the National Portrait Gallery that I had last week. So I had a big show in the museum and now I'm planning my next trip, which I think is to Japan next week. Ah, excellent. Well, so I don't want you to really describe what you do because it's too hard. We'll show what you do, and we'll probably <laughs> start with you after all the introductions because it's impossible to describe, but it's wonderful to see. All right, in the next block, we have uh, Daniel Ibanez. Hey, Daniel. Hey, how are you all tonight? Good. What are you doing? Well, I'm just at home in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I'm sitting maybe 20 miles away from a pretty large and zero percent containment fire, so I've just kind of been oh. dealing with dealing with that this this last couple of days, and, and friends that are whose houses have burned in the forest, and just kind of an interesting time here in Fort Collins. Right. But aside from that, it, I'm here in my home studio and awaiting. I'm here in my home studio and awaiting a fun digital painting project. I'm excited to start tonight. Cool. Tell while while we got you on the hook here, tell people about this uh, art show that you do. Well, it's every Tuesday, and sometimes we see Dave and Paul in these shows as well, and it's a Digital Painting 101 Google Plus Hangout on Air based art education show. Basically what we do is we bring people on both as hobbyist painters and professional painters, and we try to illuminate little tidbits about what makes painting fun, what makes painting accessible, and try to make it um, something that people will be a little less afraid to give a shot. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. We've been doing it since February on and off. And uh, you know, thank goodness for Google Plus for providing the platform for it. Well, it's a, it's a great show, and I, I want everyone to watch it. And at some point, Daniel, you and I are going to take one of these weeks of the Variety Hour, and we get on a bunch of photographers, and we're all going to do live painting together and really embarrass the heck out of ourselves. So that's that'll be fun. Idea. That's a good that is going to be a blast. That I think some painters blast. have an advantage, though, because they, they can see light and dark well. You, know? I mean, you, some, you photographers some photographers. Have, yeah. Some photographers yeah. have an advantage. Yeah. I think yeah. that's, that's the thing, without saying too much. Just the awesome parallel is that we're both painting with light. We're just using different tools. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting to think about, especially as we post-process more and more. It's, um, it's hard, very hard for me to describe I don't even know how to say what I do anymore. Uh, it's weird, you know. It's a weird world. Uh, well, let's let's say hi to Paul in the next in the next queue Hello. over here. Hey, Paul, how are you? Hi, I'm good. My name is Paul Rustan. I'm a body painter. I've been painting. I've been airbrushing since 2001, and I've been body painting since 2005. <laughs> how do you become a body painter, you know, but it just sort of fell in my lap and, and I fell in love with it and it seems like it's something that I was meant to do so I've been doing it for 
the last seven years. Cool. Well, uh, while you are here, I'm going to advertise your book. Okay, let me see. Let me screen. I'm going to share my screen. So if you guys want to find out um, even more about Paul than you will tonight, he wrote this great ebook here. It's called Diary of a Body Painter, and it's over on flatbooks.com. And it's all about uh, Paul and his work and how he does what he does. Um, here's a few preview of the screenshots in here. It's a nice uh, long ebook with all kinds of details. If you're into some uh, guys and this sort of thing or painting, you might enjoy it. Um, he does all sorts of stuff. I won't even begin to uh, describe it now. I'll have him do it himself. But really, I mean, as you can just see from these sample pages, it's uh, it's incredible. It's one of our uh, it's one of my favorite ebooks on here, and I hope you uh, hope you guys enjoy it too. Thank you, Trey. Uh, yeah, you bet. Um, do you, why don't you say something else about it? Yeah, yeah. The the reason I made it, I mean, besides the the belief that ebooks are sort of the next big thing, um, body body painting on nude bodies, especially, has a really weird reception. You know, the the whole nudity thing. Some people take it the wrong way, and some people see it the way I intend it. You know. Um, and actually, I've run into that problem in every every facet, like including trying to get um, grants, art grants, and uh, you know some some art grants give you uh, money to make your work, and some of them give you feedback on the jury process. And I've gotten feedback where half the jurors are like, "This is great, this is awesome, let's give them the money," and then the other half is like, "No, this is a." Uh, Pornographic. <laughs> this is pornographic. This is exploitative of women, even though I like submit images of men. And, you know, it's it's really interesting how people deal with it. So I felt like an ebook would have been a great place to show the behind scene, the behind the scenes events, and some stories um, coming from my mind and my perception of body painting and how I intend it to be. And so it talks about I, I talk about pretty much everything, and even including like the most common questions that people ask me, you know, so they can get a bun better understanding for what I deal with. Um, I think it's a pretty complete book. It's a good book at a good price. It is. It's a great price. It's a great price. I, I agree. Um, and while I'm here, I'll just go ahead and promote a few other um, authors on here that you might like. Pava. This is not uh, painting Troy. bodies. In, oh, sorry, Troy. I'm, I apologize, Troy. Um, and he has all sorts of uh, tri tips and tricks about this style of photography. I think you'll think this is very uh, unique. You know, you don't see a lot of stuff like this, and it's uh, some really cool tricks and arrows to add to your artistic quiver. Uh, really, really nice stuff and very detailed. Uh, that is definitely a recommended book. And here's another new one. I think it just launched this week. Um, it's up here on the cover page. It's called Insects in a Flash. Uh, very cool one, all about uh, macro photography. If you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, I know a lot of people like macro photography. I don't do much of it, but seeing this makes me want to do more of it. Um, again, nice and detailed, um, all kinds of interesting stuff. I think you'll get a lot out of this one, too. So, Anyway, and all these people are on Google+. I hope you go uh, support your local Google+. Plus. Um, artist and author. I think it's kind of a fun way to do it. And uh, as for me, I'm coming to you guys from uh, New Zealand. I closed these shades because it was so bright behind me. I was like silhouetted and I looked kind of weird. But I will show you at the window. I know people are yeah, like, I was going to say, you got to show them the view for a second at yeah, least. Dave was earlier was like, Paul's got a better background than you. I think Dave's a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that view. Yeah, so this is Queenstown below me. Um, look over here. This kind of pans over towards part of the, the main town that's at the base of those hills. And then uh, today it's kind of bright and sunny. Last time it was quite uh, uh, rainy and stormy, but today is a nice day. It's quite cold out there. It's uh, supposed to snow tonight. Um, it's a very crisp kind of uh, 34 degrees or so, but it's uh, it's very nice. In fact, right 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 before this, right before I met you guys, um, I was down in town. I had um, lunch with.
ebook too. So that'll be that'll be kind of cool. All right. Well, let's. Uh, oh, also, I want to introduce uh, Dave. He's our uh, producer here. Hey, Dave. Hello, hey everybody. I'm good. I'm Dave Effer. I'm a world-renowned finger painter and a sculptor. And <laughs> you can find my stuff at plusdave.com, minus the finger painting and sculpting. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so let's let's start with Alexa because I'm dying for people to see her work. If you haven't, um, I think you're really going to be surprised. I um, I love looking at all kinds of really weird and interesting different art stuff that kind of confuses me makes me wonder and the first time I saw her stuff I was really uh, both confused and awestruck and which is strange because I usually I like to figure out how people do something and I was really really surprised so anyway with, with no more build up why don't you just kind of show us what you do there Alexa sure um, would you rather me explain what I do first or show a picture of that uh, no, I, I like it. I like how you do. You know how you show a picture of the final work, and then let people right. kind of guess, and then you'll do the pullback shot. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> totally. So um, this here is a painting of a man on top of a man. So I took a man and I painted directly on top of oh, his no. skin, his clothes on the wall and the floor, and then I photographed it. And there isn't any painting in Photoshop or anything to add the brushstrokes after the fact. It's all in the way that I um, paint it. So if you go, if I go to the next picture, you'll see what I'm talking about. So this is all just a constructed set in which this person is housed and then photographed. Cool. That's great. You, you pretty much have to deal with the same thing I, I deal with all the time, and the whole is it real question. You know, that's why yeah. I'm showing the picture of you. It's 1% Photoshop. You can't say it's not Photoshop. And um, people have a hard enough time already believing exactly what I do. And I really like to have the opportunity to do my installations live in public because then people can um, take the photos themselves and actually see what is right. happening and experience right. it for themselves. Yeah. yeah, I feel the same uh, way about body painting. It seems like in this day and age, the live aspect is the, the best way to view it, which is kind of cool for the Hangouts because people can see it all happening live. <laughs> yeah. How often do you do that, Paul? I've done five, I think, five or six. I, it's kind of a difficult thing to arrange, you know. But um, And at the same time, I like to, like when you do a live body painting, like my work is very, con I try to push it the limits as far as I can, my own limits. And when I do a live body painting and I'm constantly being asked questions and relaying information, it makes that 20 times harder, you know. So for the live stuff, it's a little bit, tamer body painting, stuff that's sort of easy for me to do. Um, and then I like to make sure that I take my own time to do it on my own so I can really give it my full energy. So I don't do it as often as I'd like to, but I have to do it. Yeah. Not all the time. <laughs> so yeah. I, I have a question. I'm not really sure necessarily if the format of this allows for that. But um, So you're saying that's a lot harder when you do it live because people are asking you questions. Do you also yeah. find that's harder when your models are asking you questions? No. No, I mean, the cool thing, like here behind me, I wanted to surprise you guys with a live model today, but I couldn't get one arranged in, in a short amount of time. But back here are two mannequins that I painted, and I have these at gallery shows for the same reason you take images uh, of you shooting your work. Because if I just put gallery prints on the wall, then people think it's not real. So I have the images on the wall, I have mannequins, I have live uh, full HD video, uh, looping on a widescreen TV, and then I have a couple live models walking around also, so there's no doubt. <laughs> Not that it should matter, you know, it really shouldn't matter. The result of the work should be the most important thing. Like, um, But um, when I painted these models to answer your question, these mannequins to answer your question, um, it was like the most boring thing in the world, because they, cause they weren't responding to my questions. <laughs> because they don't, there's no interaction there, you know.
watching, asking you sort of redundant questions. You know, you know, when you do things live, you got you answer the same question like 15 times, um, and it gets kind of old and it's just repetitive. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I find too with um, painting in front of an audience, it's fun in its own way. But like, there's something really special about the dynamic between me and the model and the energy that we play off each other. And then when someone kind of interjects because they're curious, it um, kind of scatters my attention somewhere else. And I like it yeah. to just be like the two of us in our own world. Yeah, they break your bubble, sort of. Do you do yeah. painting on canvas too? Um, no. I'll sometimes paint on backgrounds or like on the floor, but I don't... Do oh, what? I was, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I was going to say, how do you feel about that? Is it boring when you're painting canvas versus painting a model? Like it is for me, painting a mannequin. Um... Yeah, a little bit, but I mean, I think I mostly don't like to paint on canvas so much because I'm really interested in like the installation aspect of my work, mm. and that's about space and creating yeah. something in real space. So to create something that's just pictorial on a flat plane seems less like mm. um, engaging to me in that way. Yeah, it's kind of funny actually. The more the more I get deeper into this, which is now seven years deep, um, you know, or some of the, one of the questions I always got is, why don't you just paint on canvas? But now that I'm so deep on it, I'm like, why doesn't everyone just paint on people? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, who picked canvas <laughs> first? <laughs> it's so much more fun to paint on people. But hey, Alexa, a, you know, how did you opinion. come up with this idea of painting 3D people than taking a 2D photo? Yeah, so um, I was initially really inspired by shadows, and I started putting... forever fixed, I decided to take a photo. And within that photo, there was some magic. There was something going on here. Or have you, have you like stepped back and thought about 3D and 2D in sort of a philosophical way? You you ever ruminated on that? What do you what do you what goes through your head? Yeah. Um, well, one of the challenges to doing what I do is that you know I could just paint um, on top of these objects in this one to one ratio, paint what I see directly on top of it, but then it doesn't sit in the world as a three dimensional rendering of a two dimensional space. It feels like you've covered like a three dimensional object in a three dimensional painting. So in order to make it look two dimensional, I have to in my head see this object, and then think, if I were to paint this on a flat canvas, how would I paint it? What would I do? So I have to constantly flip back and forth my way of seeing and then my way of painting. That's interesting. Well, let's, let's look at some more art from, from all you guys. Uh, Paul, let's, let's jump over and see some of your stuff. All right. Um, I didn't really order these in any specific order, but let me see what I got here. I'll talk quick about this. This one, this is an old one. Can you see this? The blue yes, wallpaper. Yep. This is, um, I'm, I'm a very, very frugal photographer. And this, this was shot in 2008. And um, I, I never had money for top of the line equipment. So this, I, I always love the look of a uh, ring flash. Uh, but this was before I even made my own ring light. This was just putting uh, one light above the camera and one light below the camera. And I, I used a wide angle lens because I didn't I didn't have a studio space. This is the, the corner in my bedroom. Um, and it just uh, this was this was a period where I was really focusing on technique a lot. And so I, I was just trying to figure out how to do this, you know, because I, st I started in two thousand five and and uh, this is two thousand eight. So I you know I found I found the repetitive uh, pattern of the wallpaper. I cut a stencil out of it and applied it on her. And and actually, um, in relation to what Alexa just said about turning a 3D surface into 2D, it was hard to apply this, tie this 2D surface onto a 3D body because uh, the stencil, you know, wasn't wrapping around the, the body evenly. So it was really, it looks like it's simple, but it was really, really, really challenging. Um, so that's a uh, fleur-de-lis. 
And then this next one. Yeah, <coughs> this I have one a question I about that. Yeah. One. Oh, never mind. All right, let me go back. Um, if you go back to the wallpaper one. Um, so I'm sorry. Did you say that that was existing wallpaper that you found, or you yeah, um, created? Yeah, it's on it my it's okay. on my bedroom. It's still on my wall now. So did that feel very personal to you to like be residing within this space and then to transform um, it and incorporate Not really. Yours? I mean, it's just a matter of of availability. And basically, at the time, I was using every part of my home to to do some sort of studio shoot. So, so I think the first first four years, maybe I just took advantage of every little section of my house. And when when I like finished with that, like I couldn't take any more out of it. I, then I started to shoot on location. All these, you know, these transitions in my evolution. And I'll show you some of that work in a little Great bit. Great photo too. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Really nice. But I've since, after this, you know, I really wanted to ring flash, but ring flashes, are like, I think they start at like $300 or something. I built a ring light out of a utility lamp. Um, fluorescent circular utility lamp, built a little hook to attach it to my camera and added a switch and a plug to it and, and I was able to do that um, for 50 bucks. <laughs> Works great awesome. with a wide angle lens too. Uh, this this image is uh, it's called um, Cabin Fever. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. But um, it's it's cool. This is a model that I've painted 11 times. This is the 11th time. And she had posted on Facebook that she broke both her ankles. And, and I saw it, you know, after finding out she was okay, I saw it as an opportunity to take advantage of. So I, like, raced to do that before she healed. And, and um, the cool thing about spontaneous situations like that is, like, they inspire their own concepts. And so it was pretty easy to come up with this concept of escape her body. And it was kind of difficult, actually, too, because she had cabin fever, and we were getting, like, halfway through the painting, I wanted to get out of there, because <laughs> we were mm -hmm. fighting about everything. But um, that's cabin fever. We're good friends. We have, like, we're, we're, I'm not saying that we, like, you know, yell at each other all the time. It's just, uh, we were crazy. Hey, Paul, <laughs> I gotta, yeah. can I ask you a question about this one? Yeah. So when I was asked to be here tonight, one of the things I kept thinking about was when I did a... Um, my BFA was both in pottery, ceramics, and um, painting. And I kept thinking about ceramics tonight before this body painting episode. The reason I loved ceramics is that it was you're crafting vessels that have a very distinctive element to them. They have an interior volume. And these, this interior volume and this, this idea of a vessel is very much aligned with the body. Um, it's, a, it's a very good symbol, almost a synonym for the body, that which has this exterior surface but an interior volume, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know? um, your piece makes me think about dealing with that interior volume. How much do you think about not just this, the surface of your models, but how to sort of embrace that interior volume and that juxtaposition of the two? You and mean both literally and physically? Or one or the I other? Guess, or? I guess I was maybe comparing it to ceramics, how in ceramics the vessel is sort of a symbol for the body. Here you're dealing with the body as a symbol for what? Or what does what do you try to transform the body into through your work? Well, in the last in the last maybe two or three years, like I said, around two thousand eight, that was where I was really exploring technique. Mm -hmm. And then I started to lose value in that because it became it became painting painting something random on a person who's who has personality and character and experiences very unique personality and I felt like that wasn't celebrating who I was painting so mm -hmm. now the the most important part of the image the final image to me I mean it's not just it's not just a body painting. It's a, it's a photograph, which is an art form in itself. And it's a person. It's a portrait of a person. So I use body painting as a medium to tell a story. Inside out visually, so people can sort of get an idea of who they are. And that's really hard to do. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, I challenge myself to do that all the time, but sometimes I can't. 
And and as a result of doing that, I'm I'm drawn to working with people that I've worked with before because of the relationships that we've built, and and I know them, and I can get into a fight with them and and dislike them <laughs> halfway through the yeah. painting, and then love them at the end, you know. Um, but uh, that's what it's I, all about to me. You know, it's telling a story I, about. I, I wanted to ask like Alexa that. the same thing. Sorry. Oh yeah, well I was actually going to respond to that, so I'm glad you're asking me too. Um, I mean, one thing about painting physically on the body as opposed to on the canvas is that no person is a blank canvas. I mean, every body is inscribed with meeting and it, you could approach it as like this physical thing that's sitting before you as if it were, you know, just something that you create art on. But every person brings a story to it. I mean, there's so much happening with the energy between the two people that like there is that interiority that comes out of them and then through your brush strokes or what you create it's a reflection of their interiority as well as the exterior yeah That's i remember i remember thing. once watching a making of of star wars a new hope and some somebody had asked george lucas uh, what they thought what he thought of special effects and he he said special effects should not be the main feature of the film. It should be like, like the uh, like the bones, the structure to help tell the story. And that's I feel the same way about body painting. Unfortunately, I think you forgot about that in the earlier three episodes. <laughs> but um, I I I always think about that when I'm thinking about body painting. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with decorative body painting, where the person is all all of a sudden kind of objectified. There's some really beautiful decorative body painting. But for me, I'm really um, can you go a little bit more to that question as well to tie in um, yeah. just a moment. Hey, and Dave, if you don't see her stuff come up full screen here where she talks about it, let me know. My my computer seems to lag a little bit. Okay. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, this was the very first time that I painted directly on myself. And um, I think when you, with the question about, like, interiority versus, like, just a surface, um, when I'm creating my art, I'm using the body, but I'm not using it as, like, a place to put on some other design. I'm creating a person of the person directly on top of themselves. So whether I like it or not, I'm directly referencing what's there. It's all about this person before me. Um, sometimes I might alter their appearance, but at the end of the day, it's still a reflection of what was there before I arrived. Um, so let me see. I'll show you I love this that one. picture, by the way. Yeah. yeah, this one is very highly stylized. And um, wow. Trey actually, I believe, saw this picture in real life with the model there. Um, but... Let me see if I can show you guys more. That's um, difficult. So you had to bright you had to basically brighten the edges of the neck, right, to make it flat. So the the center uh, of the yeah, neck. Yeah, the little. I Sorry. used um very flat light for that, so that oh, helped okay. to kind of eliminate the shadows. Yeah. Um, and this piece this was a self portrait, and painting half my face was challenging, but not too bad. The thing that was difficult was photographing myself. Um, because I had to have my chin line up perfectly with my neck and my forehead with the line on the back wall. Um, so there's a lot of challenges within this that I guess I wouldn't associate with typical painting. Um, but I can go back to you guys. I have some more pictures I can show you yeah, later. You know, sort of have you heard of Alexa? <laughs> <laughs> have you, you've heard of Varushka, right, Alexa? Yeah, I have. Yeah. She's sort of yeah. like the the main gal in body painting who in the 70s, 60s, 70s, she, she was painting herself with, with the help of her photographer too. But it sort mm -hmm. of remind, that, that picture especially reminded me of her a little bit. Just the one where I'm but yeah, just the, yeah, just sort of the mood of it, you know. I, I love hearing about this process, Paul, and Alexa, that, um, you know, at first you, you discover a new, it's like discovering a new toy and it's just the technique like, oh my gosh, this is fun, you're just making marks. And then you kind of have that movement from that conceptual or personal or uh, that the demand of your heart so much, or sort of. Um, it's cool to hear 
about that and what it is that really motivates you as painters. You know, because that, like, uh, for us watching, we go, oh, my gosh, look at this, this technique. It's very novel. But then that will wear off very quickly. Um, what stays with us is your vision as an artist. And so it's really good to hear that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, it's, it's like an obsession, I, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lit. Um, this actually might be a good opportunity to show you a couple more photos, actually. Um, yes, so something please. that I'm really interested in playing with, in addition to this technique and the concept that I've developed, is um, like the idea of the picture plane and pictorial space. And so let me show you a project I did last week. Um, so this is part of a series. Um, this was at the National Portrait Gallery. I did an installation where I did a space that looked like a painted room in which I had the live model walk through. And then I had a hole cut out in the back wall so that um, viewers could walk by and then be part mm -hmm. of the piece. So That's it looks great. like it's a photo hanging on the wall of a painting, and yet <laughs> it's a both idea. a photo mm -hmm. of everything. Um, and then I also had a second painted model who I had kind of poke into the black and white world. And um, then I idea. entered within the space, and I had the painted model behind it. Um, so uh, I'm really interested in you know representational spaces, whether it's of a painting or the photograph or real three-dimensional space that you can travel through. Where do you come awesome. up with these like, crazy ideas? They're great, but <laughs> what do you, so, like, where do, do you come up with them in the shower or like right when you're waking <laughs> up? Or, you know, I mean, is yeah. there an idea generation, uh, you know, cube? That my you my favorite. You hit your, do you hit your head on the toilet bowl? And, i got to you know, say about that last <laughs> picture. My favorite part of that last picture is how you make it look like the perspective is a little skewed. That's what makes yeah. it, that's what sells it to the direction and the wallpaper is all over the place. <laughs> it's totally. like almost like a spider yeah. web, you know. And that's just um, like that that's a painting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this space was really fun to construct because um, I did actually have the floor painted to be planted, as you guessed, and um, the floorboards taper towards the back wall. And the picture frame on the back wall, too, was hung up to be slightly slanted, and um, the cutout wasn't a perfect rectangle, but was like this kind of wavy mess. And uh, I think that's kind of those irregularities in the space which partly make it so exciting. The thing that I, when the, the first one you showed with the visitor traveling behind the frame, mm -hmm. it immediately reminded me of Las Meninas but by Diego Velasquez uh -huh. and this sort of way that he was playing with viewer and perspective and artist all within the same context. It's cool to see this as a modern homage to that wonderfully famous painting. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'll go back to being normal. <laughs> I have real quick since we're sort of on that topic of this art, like this popped into my head uh, I had to look for the image but it popped into my head like three times since we've been talking already about changing perspectives and adjusting two dimensions to fit three dimensions and this this is one that that I did a long time ago this is like 2006 I think can you see this yeah yeah um I had to paint her legs I had to sit her down in that pose and paint her legs with like my head on the ground so I could see it correctly. If she were to stand up, the bottom of the fire hydrant would be like totally crazy, you know, coming in all different directions. Um, that so just, did she have I just to wanna... No, just for the legs, the whole upper body she was okay. standing in. Um, it was hard. Did she have like knee pads <laughs> or pillows to kneel on or anything? Um, I can't remember. Probably. This is this is a totally photo manipulated image. This was shot in the studio. The dog was shot separately. Um, the background is like background is like outside of my house, and down the street. Uh, before this was before I started seeing the value in keeping my body paint and body paint images more true to life. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to find my screen again. Um, so I have a question with this one. Um, so did you have the camera set up at one fixed vantage point that would be like the key angle or like did you have some wiggle room to like work at oh, different no, angles? I always, 
I never, I rarely, I can't say never, but I rarely um, limit the photography like that. I usually have a painting, and if I have an image in my head of on how it's going to look at the end, I always take that image, but I always go crazy from all different angles trying to find something better. So I don't limit it to just that, you know. For that, I knew that I could only really truly see it best at, at a limited angle, you know, maybe like one foot up and down max and left and right was a little bit wider probably. But I didn't photograph that one actually. That was before I started photographing my own work. That was another photographer that goes by the business name Atolo Validus. Um, yeah. Cool. Show us some more. Okay. Let me see. Did I close this? Uh, <laughs> Okay. Hey, I was looking at a, there was a question that came in um, in the comments. Um, like, it doesn't really matter which one, I guess, but like that, uh, that girl there, how long did it take to paint her? This one, it usually takes me around three hours, head to toe, front and back. Some, the longest body painting I did was for a competition. We were, give, were given six hours to paint, and so I just took advantage of it. The longest studio body painting was probably five and a half hours, but on average, it's like three hours. Um, now, what was it about the one that took five and a half hours that made it? This is just an exploration on a, a portrait. Like, like I said, I like to work with models that I'm, I have a, a b relationships already established with. And this was my first time working with her. Like I said, I like Crystal. to work with models that I have uh, uh, exactly. relationships already established with. And this was my first time working with her. Like I said, I like to work with models. Is that you, Trey? Uh, Trey. Yeah, Trey. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, uh, I was watching the... Uh, the YouTube live comments. I was going to get it, pluck a few questions out, but I didn't realize the audio was on. Go on, uh, Paul. <laughs> this is great. Sorry. So, so this is a, this was my first time work, working with her, and I, I hope to work with her many more times um, now that I'm getting to know her. Um, but the 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 meaning of this body painting for me, uh, the first time I met her, she was speaking to me with this heavy English accent, and I was I was totally drawn to her look and her voice and everything. And then she revealed to me mid-conversation that she's not English at all and that she had made a bet with a friend of hers a long time ago that they could talk English for like three months. And at the end of the three months, she just, it grew on her. So she continued to talk that way. <laughs> <laughs> so she's not really British, I guess I should say. No, English, yeah, English. Um, I don't know, Great Britain, that's, that's British, right? Yeah, I'm confused now. British. So it's sort of like a it's it's sort of a based off loosely based off of the flag, and a little skewed, changed the colors up just a little bit and made it a little wishy washy, to represent that story, and so some of those stories you know are are definitely like you can't look at the picture and know that story. So some of them are more, I, I'm, I keep them a little private like that, so I know the meaning more than others. But some of them you have to look hard to figure it out, and then, and then others are very apparent. But that's crystal. But with this one, that is more about like conveying like a mood and like an idea rather than the fire hydrant, which is very much like this is what it sh I expect it to look like pictorially. I guess with right. this one, like, were you able to have her in like many different poses as long as it kind oh, of yeah. showed her back yeah, and different lighting? And she's standing up, uh, side views, front views. I like this shot a lot because of her facial expressions. It's just it's very striking to me. And I like the lighting, and it just. It just sort of represents what I thought of her the first time I met her. Uh, this next image was the first time I uh, explored uh, glow in the dark, uh, glow in the dark paint, and so I, I didn't, I didn't think about it beforehand. I had assumed that you could charge the paint and it would stay stay glowing for a while, but it faded real quick. And in a bottle, you can't charge a bottle of paint, and expect the center of the bottle to glow. So I was basically painting blind. I couldn't see what I was painting, but I had a had an idea of what was happening. And then we would charge her and then turn the lights off and then I could see what I was doing. 
But this is a result, and the, the challenging part was the exposures, I think, were like five seconds long. With, but it came up with cool results because as she moved, like in this shot, she's got her hands on her face, but also on the top of her head. So if you mm -hmm. look at the side of her temples, it's probably hard to see for the viewers because of the quality of the stream, but um, she's got the hands on the top of her head and under her face, and her arms are up and down. And it just came up with this really cool ghostly result. Did you paint the um, lines on her forearms too, or that was just because of the blur? The lines on her forearm, the little like yeah, where it looks like it connects to her chest. Yeah, I painted those. Everything that's green is is paint. That's really cool. And it's kind of cool because there is no light source except her. She is the light source for the image. There was no other. There's no studio lights or any ambient light or anything. The room was completely dark, and I was using her as my photographic lighting. This was an yeah, experiment. Were you, were you on a tripod when you shot it? Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way I could have gotten it with a tripod. I, I couldn't even get a video of it. I really wanted to get video, but it was so dim. My camera couldn't yeah, capture seen those, it. Yeah, you those. The only time I've seen anything like that, but I've never seen a good photo, is... They have these bioluminescent bays. There's like oh, yeah. vehicle where they have these microorganisms that are either blue or green. And when yeah. you're there, you know, you could you could take your hand out of the lake. You have to go at midnight. It's really freaky. This is one of my fears is being in water in the dark. Really. Oh yeah. I, it's I, pretty scary. I, really, I had to do it, so I got in and you you pull your hand out of the water and then you have all these little uh, these little microorganisms, these bright blue organisms going down your hand, and your whole hand glows blue. It's the coolest. That's what paint, what kind of paints do you guys use? This was, uh, this was Phoenix Inc.'s brand glow-in-the-dark makeup. And so what do you use for your other... Uh, I, use, I use a variety of brands. Um, mostly water-based makeup, uh, Maron, uh, European Body Art, um, Cryolon, uh, Ben Nye, all the stuff made for use on skin. Um, and I use non-toxic acrylic paint, um, so it's actually paint that holds brush strokes and I'm able to build up that thick texture, um, but it's all non-toxic. I've called up the company that I use and... Um, talk to them about their ingredients and everything. Do you, do you, um, do you have your model sign uh, waivers? I do, like health? yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> That's all I was I've learned the hard way. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably Luckily. a story now that for on air. Luckily, the model is a good friend of mine, so I didn't get my pants suit off. But I, make sure, I make sure everything I use on skin is approved, is approved for use on skin. Um, there's another word for it. I can't remember what it was. Anyways. Yeah, I, safety really is really important, important obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm constantly checking in with the model. Sometimes, like, you know, the model is sitting there and they, like, zone out. And, like, all of a sudden, like, oh, my God, are you okay? And they're like, what? And they just, like, space for a minute and they're fine. But, you know, yeah, I've always been, like, very closely monitoring them. Because even the stuff that's made for skin, you know, people, people can have an allergic reaction to anything. So um, right. really, by using stuff that's a, approved for use on skin, it's, it just saves you, saves your ear back in case of something bad happening. But I guess is, the golden is rule is... That, uh, gold finger scene when he painted... No, that's a total myth. That's a total gold myth. and she died. No, she's alive. She's alive right now. <laughs> it's a total myth. That was on Mythbusters, actually. They proved that wrong. <laughs> they tested it and everything. But, um... Yeah, like for for me, like the golden rule is if you apply the paint and they feel like um, aggressively itchy or or feel some sort of heat, you you got to get it off immediately, and that's that's the end of it. Otherwise, it's fair game. You did your work. I know you don't paint on bodies, but do you have a few uh, paintings you might like to share with us that? Uh, no rush. And I think Alexa has a few more to show, maybe two more to show to us after you, Daniel. Cool. And I know Paul has a lot more. Yeah. We'll see. We want to see a whole lot more. I got to do, do more showing and less talking, right? 
No, I, we like we like both. We'll do. Can we'll you do see my screen right now? Yeah. yeah. Blue box it. Yeah, we see you, Daniel. Go ahead. Green box it. All right. Well, I'm not seeing it, so I just want to make sure you guys are. Um, I'm an oil painter and a digital painter, and I paint on flat things, unlike these people. <laughs> and uh, are you still seeing my screen? Is that yeah, we see it perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's just unnerving that I can't see it. So, um, I usually uh, use my friends for models as well. I just find that that relationship is more fulfilling, like you were talking about, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Here's an example of some science fiction illustration that I've done. Did the picture change? Okay, good. Yes. All right. But I'm also an instructor, and here's an example from, this is a study. This is a 15-minute um, how-to watercolor illustration. This is probably a two-foot by two-foot awesome. illustration. And, you know, just, I love all paint, whether it's watercolor, oil, digital, acrylic, on 3D objects, on 2D objects, doesn't matter. I just love paint. And uh, here's a detail from an oil. Here's an oil of Florence. I love to paint while I travel. This is from a season series. This is uh, fall. Surprise, surprise. Here's a more sci-fi illustration inspired by the That's musician cool. Flying Lotus. This is a, another... This is from the Masquerade series. That one's really cinematic, both of those. Yeah, I love it's that like theatrical stuff. Yeah. It was fun to post these on Google Plus and ask for title suggestions. I had hundreds and hundreds of ideas come in. It was awesome. And then, you know, landscape work, more illustration work, more from that cinematic mask series, more sci-fi illustration, um, still life, you name it. Um, I just love to make art. Daniel, are you are you big into sci-fi? Yeah, I love I love watching movies and um, I consume media like uh, like today's my last day on the planet. So whether it's movies, games, music, whatever it is, I just love it. Yeah, me and too. Okay, give me a couple sci-fi uh, things that I might not have seen that I need to see. <laughs> oh, sci-fi movies. Okay, how about? The old classic Brazil. Have you seen that one? Yeah. No. That's, That's a good. really good one. It's not traditional like sci-fi, but it, it does have some serious sci-fi leanings. I think it was directed by one? Terry Gilliam. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. awesome. So um, it's crazy. Like all his movies are crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he also did City of Lost Children, which was bizarre. No, no, no. That that wasn't Terry Gilliam. No. Well, I think that's no, the same director that was, as Brazil. Um, oh, actually, you might be right. That, I mean, it's not Terry Gilliam that did City of Lost Children. City of Lost Children is uh, the same guy that directed Alien Resurrection and Amelie. Gosh, uh, what's his name? I'm, Jean, I'm Jean-Pierre Jean Genet. Jean-Pierre Genet. Yeah, he's amazing. Amelie is one of my favorite films ever. Yeah. Um, what else? Put me on small. the spot, man. I, I think some great modern movies are Children of Men with Clive Owen. Yeah. It's an amazing movie. Um Gattaca is a fun one. It's not as much of an oddball. That's kind of more. Yeah, that's a good sci-fi one. Yeah. And um, what was that oh, one I'm called? Sunshine was that? Oh yeah, I didn't like that one that much. I, I didn't think it was great, but it's kind of an a little yeah, bit the more. The first thirty awful. minutes were awesome, but then it turned yeah. into a horror movie. Yeah, it was weird. But I I, I got to stick with yeah. Brazil's a great kind of off the beaten path and um, yeah. You didn't get me talking about Stanley Kubrick, man. 2001 Space Odyssey. <laughs> I love <laughs> watching that. Giant TV. You haven't seen that. Right? Giant you haven't seen that. I'm gonna. I'm <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna save. Uh, we don't want to bore Alexa here. I don't know if she's in the background, but I'm gonna save. I have the, the one of the best time travel movies that I bet no one has ever seen, and I will save that for the end of the show. Right. Time cop. But for now, no, let's, no, stop. Time let's, let's stop boring uh, Alexa oh, with our curve chasms. Oh, 
Uh, you know, when guys discover, like, oh, you're, it's kind of like a little secret, right? Because it's not... Back cool. to the future. Like, but when you kind of, like, softly broach the subject with another dude, like, are you into sci-fi? <laughs> oh, then it's on. It's on. So let's, let's uh, pull ourselves out of that one-way ticket. So let's Alexa, talk about football. Us, yeah. <laughs> Alexa, show us some, of your, some more art. Sure. All right. A little bit. Um, so I really like juxtaposing the real life with the painted image. Um, so you can see that in this piece where I'm sitting down next to my model. Um, and then you can also see this gear where I painted a model and I took him on the subway. And there was just amazing reaction. I think that's going to be an iconic image. Yeah. That's going to yeah. stand the test of time. Oh. It's good in the and you painted the flag on his shirt too, right? That's awesome. I did, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, he's a yeah. Um, and then this one was um, I actually painted on the surface of the car, oh, and um, wow. but don't worry, it all washed off the did car. You like it was totally did you like painting a car? Yeah, it was. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that it would be really time consuming because it's so large, but yeah. the surface was like so smooth that the paint just like slide over it so beautifully. Um, and something that surprised me with that was that I used almost no black paint, even though it was a black car. I went through a lot more white paint. Mm. And um, yeah, no, it was pretty exciting, like painting something that I could drive away. <laughs> that's, but, that's true. That's yeah. totally true. But then it immediately got all washed off. And then um, the last piece I have to show you guys is a self-portrait I did. Um, you may have noticed it in the background of my studio while I've been talking to you. And um, this one was particularly challenging because I painted myself full hand with my left hand. Maybe I should <laughs> start painting exclusively with my left hand. Actually, um, maybe Daniel knows a little bit about this. One of the one of the techniques that I was taught in college, when uh, you know, like writer's block, when writers can't write anymore, artists have days when everything they paint just comes out like crap. And so one of the things I was taught in college was to switch hands, to loosen up my mind. And, huh. and, and then if you do that for like half an hour and then go back, all of a sudden you, you're a little more like warmed up or something and you do better. That so sounds like a really interesting <laughs> um, challenge. Like something I would definitely like to try. Just something on that, Paul. Sometimes I'll do that um, when I'm really tired or kind of bored or just, yeah, not emotionally engaged. Mm -hmm. You need that emotional engagement to be kind of present, you know, and make the painting alive. Yeah. And, and painting with my left hand or drawing with my left hand makes it just brand new. Super. It's a great, yeah. great suggestion. It almost loosens up your, your worry about technique and lets you really create something cool, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that I've um, kind of had to find through this process because, like, I used to be incredibly perfectionistic when I painted on a flat canvas when I was a teenager. And I got very really frustrated with that because it was, like, always overworked. And with this, with painting on the body, there is a limited time frame that I have to paint. It's only a window that's a couple hours long. So I have to be more loose with it and fluid and just trust the instincts of my brush strokes. That's cool. Hey, uh, you want to show us a few more, Paul? Yeah. I want to show one of my recent... It might be the last one I've done. I've had a lot of commercial work in the last... Um, two months. Actually, you know, one of the cool things that I that I love about Google Plus, talking about having relationships with the people that I paint, is that Google Plus allows me to build those relationships beforehand. And Tiffany is the second person I met on Google Plus and have sort of d developed a friendship with over time. She's the second person that I've painted. And so that relation on Google Plus and have sort of d developed a friendship with over time. She's the second person that I've painted. And so that relationship is sort of already established when it comes to the first time I paint them, which is kind of cool. So it's very suitable for me. But we did this of her. She came in from New York, uh, came to my house, and I, I painted her real quick. This is black light paint. This is pretty much all straight from the camera. She's uh, lit with two blacklight bulbs 
and she's rimlit with my iPad because it was so dim. <coughs> Camera on a tripod and everything. And it represents uh, her run for the cure for cancer, specifically endometrial cancer, which she, she had done a run early June for her uh, grandmother. And so I wanted to paint a concept that reflected that. So I have like this little, this sort of disease, this like warm colored disease spreading from the uterus outward. And then I have this cool color coming from the energy of her running motion uh, coming in from her limbs and sort of attacking. I think I can zoom and you can see close up, right? Yep. Can you? So you can see like it starts to like fight against it. The, the blue starts to battle the orange. Um, but basically, we, we did this and came up with the idea of, uh, of offering prints to people who donate. So she was able to make, I think, $800 in like three hours when we first unveiled it. And so since then, she's reached her goal um, when we got rid of 50-something uh, copies. And she has 30, 35 copies left, I think. And if and they're still available, so she she says whoever donates can get a copy of this. The remaining 35 copies at any donation price. Um, sponsor sponsor dot hangoutathon dot com. But that's that image. Sponsor dot hangoutathon dot com. Uh, and then I'll, you want me to fly through these other images, Trey? Right. Do we have a lot of time left? Yes. No. Please. Yeah. People. People <coughs> love to see. If you only say a few um, words, please. This is this is one of my uh, one of my more popular gallery images, and I stuff. I've always been better at technique uh, my whole life growing up, and then becoming a conceptual artist was always more of a challenge. Um, so being able to unload the technique and just do something kind of simple. And it's, it's not to say that this was easy, but it's just simple in design. Um, but this is a fashion model, and she does fashion posing. And it was an opportunity for me to do like a decorative body painting because that's basically what fashion is all about, objectifying the models to show a product. They're basically walking, walking uh, clothes hangers, you know, especially on the runway. So I had I had kind of fun, I had some fun doing that, and I actually used Ansel Adams as a, a reference for this image. Uh, he has a, an image of this one lake that he photographed, I think, like a hundred times, several times. And I love the ripples. I'm big on water. Water is my favorite element, and uh, so I call this one ripple. And I, I changed I changed the colors, red and white. Um, it's a good color combination. Red is powerful. Water to me is the most powerful element on Earth. That's ripple. <coughs> Natural light, 50 millimeter lens, can't go wrong. Uh, body image. A lot of people overlook this one because it's a guy. So a lot of the guys that look at my work specifically to see naked women uh, don't look close enough to this one, which is full of naked women. <laughs> but so, um, you know, this one, this guy is a fitness model. And I thought that was Dave Effer before he grew a beard. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, didn't yeah I put on a little weight after my daughter was born. <laughs> yeah, you just let it all hang out. You pee. Yeah. yeah. But so this guy, you know, as I was painting him, I mean, it just this this meaning just sort of clicked on its own. As I was painting him, he revealed how often women throw themselves at him, and uh, and so it just made total sense, total sense. So it's a, it's about body image, both figuratively and uh, literally. This this was uh, one of the first times I was trying to approach doing a portrait of the person. And so this is a uh, this is a visual represent representation of her, and she's a poet. She's a romantic poet. She's a hopeless romantic, and so I tried to convey uh, that through body painting. And so on her limbs, on her limbs going towards her house. And then I have a lot of on-location shoots. I've been, I'm always fascinated with putting models on location. A lot of times I see landscape images, and, and some of them look incomplete to me because they're missing people. I love people. And that's not to say that those images are bad. It's just that I'm totally drawn to people. Um, 
So so every t every once in a while I'm driving around and I see some cool location and I can't help but want to photograph a model there. And lately I've been really into doing guerrilla photography, illegal photo shoots of naked people on the street. <laughs> so it's very risky, you know. But I haven't had any problems with that. This is at Brown University in Rhode Island. This is an abandoned roller coaster in Massachusetts. Um, this was actually after Hurricane Irene. The, the hurricane had blown the, the coaster down. So I've done a shoot before and after, which is kind of cool. Uh, this was one of my competition pieces from last year, War and Peace. Superscar. <clears throat> this is one of the ones you have to look at closely, and, and most people don't. They see it at face value, but this one has a lot of meaning to me. Um, starting with the phone booth, driving by a phone booth and knowing that those are going to become extinct and they already kind of are becoming extinct uh, and I wanted to get a photo shoot done there as fast as I could and uh, it took me two years to get this image because I kept having problems with models uh, dropping out. One specific model dropped out three times, cancelled and so she was my original model that I wanted, Scar, and this was the first time I worked with her, and I've always loved loved this model. She's actually, um, she's got a pretty big um, underground following, uh, alternative following. I, um, so I was... And I asked her, and she said, hell yeah. <laughs> so she flew out here, stayed with me for a few days, and we did this, and we totally hit it off. And now she's one of my favorite models ever. She's the one that I painted in this competition piece also. But um, she goes by the name Scar overcame that. And if you look close, you can see a lot of the scars on her arms. Oh, uh, yeah. And... You know, especially in a gallery setting, I, I kind of expect people to look close and figure it out, but not everybody does. You know, it's titled Super Scar. Why is it titled Super Scar? Look close at her arm, which is actually a prominent focal point in the image. Um, and it sort of tells a story on its own. If you, if you were to meet her in person, she to me is a real deal siren, a real life siren. I've seen, I've been walking down the street with her and Random, four random girls in one block would run up to her to tell her they love her. They'd never met her before. People are just totally drawn, drawn to her. And that, that transformation, the day she decided to stop cutting herself was the day she realized that um, animals and children were frightened of her. So she was, like, she was like glowing with negativity back then, and now she's glowing with positivity, and she's like super positive. Uh, super beautiful inside and out, and she's just a real deal siren. To me, that's a real life superhero. So, super scar. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I I hate explaining all these paintings, but I love hearing the backstory on that one because I've Cause seen it's that. Like shot people so should be able to. And part of the part of the joy of art is sort of figuring it out on your own. But um, that's one that I really want people to understand. It's cool to hear the story. <clears throat> this one I included real quick. Um, I've I've had a bad habit lately of forgetting to reset my camera because I do time lapses at a lower quality and then I forget to reset it to high quality raw images and everything. So this one I did the whole painting, did a time lapse, did a photo shoot and forgot to put it back to raw. So this was shot in low peg, low res JPEGs. And so the only way I could save it was to add this Photoshop aged effect and, and removing the colors and stuff. And that saved it. I could probably print this out big and it'll look good. But that was a bummer. That's Tiffany. Uh, this one's one of my more popular images. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I'll let you guys look at it on my website closely. It's blacklight paint, and it was um, it was totally experimental. I was just practicing, but it was kind of a home run, which is usually the case when you're not thinking too hard about something. You just let the art flow out of you, and it comes out nicely. Uh, this is another example of me totally blowing the photography. <laughs> this one again, I had set, I had this set to 1500 ISO. I forgot to set it back to 200, 
And so, like, I, this was done a month or two ago, and this was one of my trips to San Francisco. And I, I flew out there specifically for this shot. I felt like it was a no-brainer. Those houses in the background are called Painted Ladies. I'd never seen anybody photograph Painted Ladies in front of the Painted Ladies. And I was like, this is a no-brainer. i got to do this. And I did it, and I blew it. <laughs> but that's part of, uh, part of the learning experience. I looked out. You can't see it in this image, but actually behind the women on the left side, there's uh, an Acura NSX, and on the right is a Peugeot, and I was like, or a Mini Cooper, and I was like, how did how how much did I look out on that? I mean, that could have been like a Ford Taurus and a, a Honda Civic. <laughs> Anyways, I'll go through these quick. Clothing. This is on my tutorial DVD. I don't usually like drawing, painting clothing, uh, because it's I mean, actually, you know, it's great that Alexa does it because she's trying to make it look unreal. But for me, when you're trying to make it look real, it sort of defeats the purpose. I feel like you might as well just wear clothes because most people can't tell. You don't even need to do a good job to make it look like like it's super real clothing because the mind sees clothes first. And I think what's cool about what Alexa does is the mind sees painting first, but it's not painting. It's pretty cool. Um, pregnant girl with a big hand grabbing her. We, were, we went to do that and that fell, that fell through several times and she sort of all of a sudden didn't want to do it, but, but she had been working on this uh, installation piece. She, she put this table out there, her name is Karen Talbot, she put this table in her yard and let it grow for like seven months and said I could use it for an art piece. And I was like, hell yeah. And this was really this was a really challenging shoot. I don't have nearly good enough equipment to pull it off. I mean I used my speed lights to light it and I think this was shot at a thousand ISO just to get the balancing of the lights to work perfectly. And it was really challenging but it came out all right. But that is the last image I brought for you guys. Oh, not true. I did bring that one image for uh, Twit. Do you want me to show? <laughs> yeah, this sure. Image for but, Twit. Uh, All right. Yeah, let me, Tony, let me, let me a, open it. Up. A special one for you, Tony. It's watching live. You can see <laughs> all the details, but the Twit recording is going to be all pixelated. So we're doing this, this one. This one I did for you, Twit. I love I love being censored. No, actually, I, I don't care if I'm censored. I understand um, the certain situations where I need to be censored. I'm always definitely trying to uh, show my work um, full nude bodies, but there's occasions, especially at live events, where I need to cover up uh, the privates and stuff for the public. So I'm, I'm empathetic to that. No, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, but this one has a good story behind it, and this will be fun for for Twit to cover up. Let me just open it up here. Oh man, Windows. Sorry guys. All right. Can you see that? All right, so this this one was hard to to uh, organize because if you, you can't probably can't tell from far away, but we got a plethora of penises all over him, including his own. It's like a where, Where's Waldo almost. But um, basically, the story behind this, I had early in my gallery career, which is not huge, but I had city here. But they showed nude paintings. That bothered me a lot. So I I decided to to do this body painting on him and I intended to photograph it with him tucked so you don't see his junk but you see just a ton of penises all over him and I wanted, I wanted to submit it and say there you go can you show that <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's Eric and his plethora of penises a lot of people don't know that I did that <laughs> but oh. I didn't end up I didn't end up submitting it because his penis is showing that was the best image from the bunch the images where his penis is not showing are not that great so I never submitted it so that's that. Okay, Dave Beffer knows all about the tech. He's very familiar <laughs> with that process. 
<laughs> Put the lotion on its skin, or else it gets the hose again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, let's uh, let's share a few uh, uh, discoveries. I'll I'll start with one here. Let me uh, let me jump over. Oh, by the way, I saw someone put a YouTube comment on there that I need to get a better mic. I know my my mic is still in a container on the way to New Zealand. Uh, we're still house shopping, and until I have a permanent place, I don't know where to tell them to deliver everything. So we actually have everything in storage. We have one container in storage in Dunedin. The second one is on the way. So anyway, my mic and all my proper equipment is is en route. It's, uh, it's high priority for me. Anyway. Okay, so let me share my little uh, discovery here. Let me go here to uh, uh, screen share. Pick my browser. Um, and then I still have a time travel movie to show you guys, of course. Let me see if I can find it. I'll show the time travel movie last. Oh, gosh. Where's the thing I was going to show? Um, here. Cool. Um, anyway, probably that's the only image I need to show you, and then you just know you want to follow this guy. <laughs> Cool. And then um, uh, also after uh, these other guys share their discoveries, um, I've got a few uh, special messages for you too. Okay, Daniel, do you have one to share? Yes, I do. Um, so let me screen share. Can you guys see it all right? Yes. Yes. All right. This guy is a personal friend of mine. His name is Rolf Batista. And what I love about the way he's using Google Plus is that he puts up a pen and ink illustration every day. This one's called the Sea of Passion, and it's this kind of siren's hair spilling out and becoming the sea. They're simple drawings of almost the musings of uh, his wandering mind through the day, and I just think it's a really neat thing. It's not like a 365 project or something like that. He just literally draws all the time and he posts the evidence of his work here. And uh, I love the simplicity of the medium and the kind of uh, short time frame of the work. And I love the, I just think it's fun. I, I love having his stuff spill through my stream every day. And this is his profile. That's Rolf Batista. Excellent. Cool. Thanks. Good one. And uh, Paul, do you have one for us? Yes. Let's do the screen share trick. <coughs> Should have had that ready. <laughs> this guy, I've um, I've promoted him a few times, but I'm just I'm just crazy in love with his work. Every time I see something new from him, he's just amazing. He's a watercolor water, watercolor painter, which anyone who's ever tried watercolor knows it's incredibly challenging. Um, and he does these very photorealistic looking watercolor paintings of nudes and all his nudes tell really 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 deep stories and have deep meanings. Let me close this chat box. <coughs> but I'll go through the images real quick. Ruben Negron, R-E-U-B-E-N-N-E-G-R-O-N. -E -E and he's amazing and his work has a lot of nudity which I felt was I think that's the last one. Now those must take forever to do. I bet, yeah. Ah. I don't think I could handle it. All right. But this, cool. these well, were all specifically add. for a show, for one specific show, so he's always posting uh, new work. Sorry. Cool. Thanks <laughs> for that one. That's a, that's a good guy. So uh, Dave will uh, link to all these people in the, in the show uh, out that I'll repost later. And also, Dave, I want you to link to this thing I'm about to mention. Uh, this guy emailed me. He's looking to hire somebody. I get these all the time, so don't expect that because you emailed me, I'm going to mention it. But I will. I kind of pick randomly. Here's a random one I, I picked. This is from a gentleman named Barry Glassman. Um, so let me just read what he said, I guess. Uh, 
So he's a, he's a photographer, and he said, the biggest challenge to my final pictures, uh, is why I feel stuck, is that I'm badly colorblind. I take fantastic pictures of my kids playing soccer and look to enhance, but instead I, I tend to turn their skin green. I also love to do HDR work, but I need help. Do you have a resource that can do an amazing job to help me editing my landscape and travel photos? Uh, you can see my work at www.bgphotos.net. Um, and so anyway, I emailed him back. He said, yes, he's totally willing to pay. So if you guys want to help him edit his photos for the proper uh, color treatment, um, he would be appreciative. And uh, here he says, uh, thanks for helping me get my photographs uh, unstuck. So that's a good opportunity for you. Now let me share another um, kind of story slash opportunity here for you. Uh, let me share my screen here. People, people, this is kind of neat. So this guy emailed me. Um, and he is really, um, he's down on his luck. Uh, he uh, was very sorry that he told me he had to sell this print. He has one of my prints, basically. It's a very valuable print, and he's, like, been out of a job for quite a while, and he has to make his mortgage. No, you know, do whatever you need to do. Anyway, this is a bamboo forest print. It's on metal, and this is very rare, actually, because it's number one in the series. It's the most valuable in this series. It's all on high uh, white gloss aluminum, it's signed. Um, these usually sell for, they start at $2,000 and then they go way up. And uh, here's another thing I'll show you. This same print uh, is the same one that Mark Zuckerberg has. Uh, and he has a higher one in the series. So if you actually end up getting this one, your, your print will be more, power, more powerful and more valuable than uh, Zuckerberg's. So there you go. That that uh, that ends in uh, five days. Uh, so go go bid on that and uh, help this guy out, and you'll end up with a, a good print of your own. That's a good and picture of Zuckerberg holding it too. Maybe we can get Sergey Brin to buy it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. uh, more powerful than Duck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, and, and here's the here's the movie that you guys need to watch if you're a true sci-fi fan, if you like time travel movies, and this is by far the smartest and possibly most complex time travel movie ever made. And if you guys are like me now, you kind of watch movies like with, an I with a, a laptop on your lap or with an iPad, you've got two things happening. Don't do that with this movie. You can't. <laughs> if you miss a minute of it, you're just going to think, oh, I think I, I missed something. Anyway, it's an independent movie. Uh, but just brilliantly written, very real. It feels like, well, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ruin it, but just trust me. Okay, it's called Primer, P R I M E R. Has anyone ever heard of it? Probably I've of not. It. I haven't seen it yet. It's on my Netflix list. Yeah, this was recommended to me by uh, Stu Mashwitz, and uh, I, I take every recommendation from Stu very, very, very seriously. And now I pass this one along. So that's it for the show. Uh, thank you, Alexa. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Glad to be here. And thank you to the uh, you. not present uh, Tony for pixelating everything. It's <laughs> great. Hi, Tony. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> and um, and we will see you next time. Everyone can just kind of wave goodbye to the little box. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Trey. Uh...
Uh, I don't know if you guys have an interest in ever coming to Fort Collins, but I own an art gallery, and you guys could like do yeah. a two-person <laughs> show. We, we have a front of the house and that. back of the house. I was going to bring that up, and I forgot. That would be cool. I totally do that. Uh, I don't know if you guys have an interest in ever coming to Fort Collins, but I own an art gallery, and you guys could like do yeah. a two-person <laughs> show. We have a front of the house <laughs> and back of the house. <laughs> Trey, <laughs> is this your first time hanging out, Trey? <laughs> I think it actually. I think it's uh, it's still recording, Dave. When you invited me back in, I think it starts up the recording again. Let me yeah, let me does. check on that. Yeah, it's on it's, it used to, but it my, shouldn't anymore. My live channel, and then it picked back up. Yeah, it's recording. Yeah. Hi, so that's, yeah. I, I didn't leave to be rude to you guys. I just left. Otherwise, YouTube yeah, just not going. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thanks again, guys. Sorry. <laughs> 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 okay, bye. 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 See you.